Hey, what's up? And welcome back to another episode of the Relationship Schools Smart Couple Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Gaddis, and I am grateful to be here as your guide and friend on the journey. This is episode number 142. We've been at this a while. So thanks for sticking with us. If you are a regular listener, uh, thanks for sharing this with your friends. I get uh, emails all the time, and I have people come up to me here in Boulder. Please introduce yourself, by the way, if you ever see me here in Colorado especially. And I love it when people come up to me and they're like, hey, I listened to your podcast. What's up, Jason? So get over your awkwardness and just interrupt me and say hi. All right, I love that. And it's so cool because I know that I'm having an impact. It's weird to talk into this mic and never hear from people. Right? I hear from some people, sure, and I share it on social media. But some of you introverted, quiet types that ne have never sent me an email or have never commented on social media, uh, it's kind of cool when you come out of the woodwork and you say, thanks, or boy, that had an impact on me, or gosh, my, I started listening differently. That means a lot to me. It's cool. It's like, all right, let's keep going. All right, that's fuel for me to keep rocking it out here. All right, as you know, this podcast is for you if you're into growth and development because the growth mindset gets somewhere in a relationship, and that somewhere is usually somewhere better. The fixed mindset, which is usually about comfort and security, and I don't want to change, I am afraid of change, and don't rock my boat, and I like it how it is, uh, doesn't get you a great relationship over time. It might get you a great relationship for six months, but not over many years, okay? Imagine if you and I were in a relationship, and on a Saturday morning, I just woke up and I drank my coffee, I went out and I mowed the lawn and I read the paper and I didn't look you in the eyes and I just, ne I just did the same shit day after day after day, year after year after year. Um, and you were like, come on, honey, let's go to this workshop. Listen, listen to this podcast. And I was like, no, I got to read uh, the New York Times again. No, nope, I'm going to watch my show. No, nope, I'm going to do my routine. Look, I like routines too, but you can see where I'm going. That kind of attitude is stuck and complacent. And some of you are with people like that. Um, and that usually is painful because you're not getting a fulfilling relationship. You're getting like a body to live with you in a house, but that's really different than like a thriving partnership. Know what I'm saying? So we work at it and we change. We transform ourselves not to be someone we're not, but to be more authentically who we are. That's the game. And your partner will reflect back all the ways in which you're a con artist or not being true to yourself or are being a strategy. And they'll continue to whittle away at you to get more and more authentic and more truthful because that's the sexiest person is when we're being who we actually are and we're giving ourselves permission to be that. It's very attractive, right? Okay. In this episode, I've got a real powerhouse here in the relational space, a young guy who is doing really good work in the world. His name is Christian Pankhurst. And I first, someone, a listener actually, I think, forwarded me uh, an email of his or something and said, check this guy out. You guys are pretty similar, or pretty aligned, I think. And I watched a video of his and I was like, whoa, this guy knows what he's talking about. And I was pretty impressed. And I thought, I got to have this guy on the podcast. So I've been uh, at it for a while and uh, finally got him on the podcast, uh, thanks to a friend, Craig. Thanks, Craig. And um, yeah, anyway, it's just really good to jam with this guy. So in this episode, we talk about a lot of stuff. I mean, this guy's got a big range. So uh, we talk about what modern masculinity looks like. We talk about what women have been trained to be and how they need to like unharness, unleash the beast within and what men can do to support that. Uh, we talk about, uh, basically he talks about one thing for men to work on. There's definitely an action step for you and there's an action step for women here. Um, we talk a lot about how to heal your past and why that matters if you wanna go deeper in relationships. Talk a lot about your relationship to yourself and how to get a good one with yourself. Um, he's got a really powerful story in the beginning about his own personal transformation. And I, I really like hearing people's stories I encourage you to listen closely to this one. It's, uh, yeah, it's moving. Um, we He's big on community work. I am as well, but he has a cool way. He calls it circle work, 
which sounds different than circling and group therapy, but he's got his own sort of modality that he learned from a friend and it sounds really powerful in his community. Um, for me, like group work in the relational space is essential because you start to get a bunch of mirrors on how you're showing up and how you're being, uh, which is like why I like group work, circling, um, group therapy, any men's work, men's groups, any type of group work where the facilitator is helping you uh, see yourself through the group's eyes. Um, because a lot of us kid ourselves and we don't get honest reflections very much. A lot of us don't get, don't have anyone in our life that will look us straight in the eye and say, hey, can I give you some feedback? Like, no, no. Can I really give you some feedback? And this is coming from my heart, sweetie or friend. Can I really let it rip here and, and share that? And we did that at the relationship school this year and it was like so powerful. Um, and people are very perceptive. You know, if you hang around people and you give them permission to give someone feedback in a safe way, it's amazing. Uh, how much it can impact people. All right, he's also got a pretty unconventional approach to getting working with anger and working with really your, your issues. And there's one particular uh, part of the podcast that he talks about. Um, we'll just say, I'm just going to give you a little teaser here. It involves tape, taping someone and getting your feelings out on your partner. All right, and uh, it's definitely unconventional, maybe even controversial. I'm it sounded interesting to me. I was like, hell yeah, let's do it. Uh, just because I like to do edgy, intense stuff. All right. Trigger warning on this one at that part. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think you're going to like this episode with Mr. Christian Pankhurst. Let's go. All right. Welcome to the show, Christian Pankhurst. Hey, you're very welcome. So happy to be here. Yeah, I'm psyched you're here, man. I've been wanting to talk to you for a while and uh, been tracking you online a bit and it just looks like you're up to some really powerful work in the world. Will you uh, tell people a little bit about you, just what you do in the world right now? Yeah. Um, uh, for the last 10 years, I've specialized in group dynamics and learning how and teaching people how being in a really powerful, strong, amplified field can open hearts and increase intimacy, specifically and first and foremost with self and then with other and how the group can really support that deepening of intimacy. Um, so although historically my work has been through workshops and events and delivering that around the world, now it's concentrated here in the Netherlands where we've got a in-house retreat center that we um, have complete control of the environment in nature and it's set up to just deliver these incredibly powerful deep dive immersion experiences where um, we take singles and couples through healing communication and sexual polarity, um, workshops. Outstanding. Wow. Um, and are you just give us a little background on you. Where do you live? Are you married kids dating? What's, what's your kind of stuff? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, uh, in, in the Netherlands, uh, although there is an option to get married, it's more popular to have this, these kind of like legalized partnerships. So, um, yes, my partner and I have been together since 2014. We bought the center together. And um, she works with women and doing a lot of sisterhood stuff and helping women come into their body and their open radiant hearts. Um, and I work with mixed, with mixed groups. Um, so yeah, we, we're, we're based here in the Netherlands, although that hasn't always been the case. I've been this well, like nomadic traveler since 2002 because I was originally a chiropractor, built a clinic, um, you know, treating patients. And then I kind of got bored with the whole back pain there must be more to it than that. And then, you know, lived in Australia, the U S Panama, Costa Rica, and just finding my way around the world. And uh, I've always had a love for Holland because my mum is Dutch. My dad is English. And so I've, mm. I'm actually Dutch by nationality and uh, British um, dual citizen, but I've always felt at home here. They've got a, a culture that's so open and free, loving, and naturally they call it gezellig, which is this mm. sense of community and belonging that's built into the culture here that I've never found anywhere else. Um, you know, living in all these different parts of the world, this is a place that I call home. Cool. That's great. Now back, back us up a little further. How did you, um, what's the sort of short story of how you got into relationship work? Why relationships? What's the big deal here? Uh, what yeah, happened? Well, actually, or, 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 originally, um, I was, uh, 
I read a book called Conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with, yeah. with, oh, yeah. with Neil. And when I read that, there was something so inherently deep and meaningful. It really touched me. And I knew in that moment that I wanted to uh, find, find a way to work with this guy. And so I went around the United States in 2003 giving kind of like free talks on donations to inspire and practice my speaking skills. And as I was going around the US, I did about, I think it was 50 talks in 30 states in three months while I was there. And word got around and Neil got to hear about it. And through a few synchronistic circumstances, I found myself in a hotel room and was part of his leadership program. And um, he saw what I was doing and he invited me to become his protege. So my first entry was really through him and I traveled the world working with him and just learning as a mentor um, or him as a mentor, just teaching me, you know, the skills that he learned. And relationship and intimacy was actually a strong part of his work. But it wasn't until I discovered uh, a profound circle methodology developed by a man called Tej Steiner, um, who lives in Oregon in the USA, where I got to see the experiential, in the moment, present moment dynamics of people relating, resolving conflict, um, sharing energy, emotion, and presence, and how different emotional energetic ranges could get activated through the leverage of an amplified field. And as soon as I saw that in 2006, I was in Sydney. And um, when I was exposed to this work about you know, 11, 12 years ago, I was just in awe at the, the accelerated path that people felt in circle. And I just said, okay, I now, that's my next thing. Mm. And uh, again, through a lot of training and mentoring uh, and just diving straight in, I was already running retreats. So I just brought in the circle work instantly into everything that I was doing. Uh, literally two weeks after my first exposure, I was in Bali and I was going to deliver a normal seminar and I just switched it right last minute. Nearly killed myself doing it because I was wholly unprepared. Uh-huh. <laughs> but that's part of how I do it, just jump in. Yeah. And uh, it's never been the same since. And gradually in doing this work, which was primarily uh, women would come. So in my first few years, I noticed that women would be the ones that would naturally come into these events. And I, yeah. I think that would make sense. As there's a lot of openness and natural curiosity there. And there was a group of women in the UK who called me up one day and said, we, we know you're doing these circle retreats, but do you do anything around relationships? Specifically, we're a bunch of single women in London. And we're always attracting the wrong types of guys. Could you, you know, if we pay you to come down here, can we just pick your brains? And so I went down and, uh, and they were all drunk when I arrived and, uh, <laughs> and I recorded the interview and it became a CD called where are all the good men. Uh-huh. And that was in 2008 and it went viral back then. And then I was inundated with couples and the individuals who wanted relationship coaching. And that's when my, that branch kind of took off. And then an event was created called love relationships and you that turned into insights to intimacy and it was primarily around communication, which has now turned more into um, a deeper type of heart connected sexual awakening practices that we help individuals and couples do, starting primarily with self intimacy. So, uh, although most couples and most people who are looking for relationship work want to learn how to connect, uh, inherently, all the work that we do in circle and with couples is around inner connection. Mm-hmm that allows that deeper connection with other to come through because there's a law of energetic couple dynamics that states that we can only be present to another to the degree that we can be present to ourselves yeah. and the specific ranges that we can hold in another need to be opened within ourselves. So, uh, it's very much a self intimacy practice. Yeah. Cool. And what's the, what's the end game for you with couples or individuals? Is it just about, I mean, I know there's probably a lot of depth here, but I just, I'm just curious, um, is, it, is it about having a fulfilling relationship? Is it about, you know, spiritual no. connection? Like what, what's your sort of frame on that? Yeah, I call it Humanity 3.0, which is a vision for embodied, integrated, sustainable community where I see that in order for us to really um, change the world, 
We need to change the environment which our kids are brought up in. We need to change the way that um, our literal communities and social systems are brought together and how communities live together and the importance of couples, parents and families are to a larger community environment that allows children to thrive and stay open uh, so that when they grow up, they become the leaders of tomorrow. So it's a long term play of empowering children through healthy relationships that they are being exposed to. That really touches me. That's right, right in my heart, just because of the relationship school and what I'm up to in the world and and how I want to impact people. So thank you for just saying that and the mission and the commitment, you know, I really see that in you and feel that it's awesome. Yeah. So that's the bigger why. If it was just about the relationships, to be honest, I think I would get a little bit bored because there's only so much pain and, disappointments and this is what isn't working that I can tolerate before I'm like, you know, there's a bigger picture here that we need to work with. Yeah. Um, People can get a little <laughs> like this, right? And yes. Indeed. Their stuff. Totally. <laughs> now, were you, um, you know, I've watched some of your story on your website, which is extremely powerful by the way. Um, and I'm, I have to, you know, just to educate the listener a little bit, I have to imagine some of your desire to help and help with relationships comes out of what happened to you when you were a teenage boy. Will you just speak mm-hmm. to, because uh, you said you grew up in a fairly normal family. A lot of us relationship healer type people uh, either grew up in a pretty intense family or a family that wasn't tracking the relational dynamics. And so therefore mm-hmm. we value that and we want to pursue that. So give us a, just a little slice of your history so the listener can have a, more of a sense. Yeah. Um, I grew up in an emotional desert where my parents got along, but were never intimate from the perspective that I define intimacy, which Mm -hmm. is a really deep bond and connection. And so I witnessed quite a cold intellectual, I would dare to say stereotypically British family, that Mm -hmm. conflict really wasn't comfortable, humor was used to deflect, and coded communication was the norm. Now, witnessing that, I learned how to be very strategic and heady in my relationship with others, specifically women. And I wasn't shown or initiated into what I would call manhood, So my uh, relationship to my sexuality um, and sex in general seems to be quite immature and it was very, uh, you know, tension release, kind of, (laughs) you know, the old style nervous system of going there, get the job done, get the hell out type thing. Um, And on, so that that was one layer of my upbringing. The other layer was um, abuse. So in one hand, there was a neglect where emotionally there was very little and physically very little touch and emotional nurturing. So I was left feeling, like I said, in an emotional desert where I was craving to be felt. Um, but on the other hand, my, my, my father suffered from this kind of like passiveness that would turn into rage. And then I would often be the focus of that rage. And we would, he, would, he would act out and hit and actually physically, you know, whether he's kicked me, punched me or throw me places. Um, and so I became very vigilant of speaking my truth, being too loud, um, not upsetting him. I, I was very good then at feeling my environment to wait yeah. for where's daddy, where's daddy, he's going to come through the next door. I can almost feel him coming down from the top of the garden, especially like watching TV in the middle of the day, which would actually send them off the roof because... He thought, you know, if there was a sunny day out there, we should be outside, which is fair enough. And yet the punishment that came for not obeying that was so extreme that, um, you know, my nervous system became very uh, frenetic. Mm -hmm. So I began to study, of course, going, you know, as a chiropractor, which is all about learning about nervous system, storing of tension, trauma, wounding, um, where that sits in the body, how to reactivate it, what is needed in order for our system to go into a safe place so we can drop deeper, start to feel what we haven't felt. As I was studying all this around neglect and trauma, wounding, violation, uh, boundaries, merging, I started to see that all these relational dynamics that were literally zipped up like a zip drive inside of my nervous system were being unpacked and reflected, projected, and shown back to me in every single relationship that I've been in. I don't think that's new to you or your listeners to know that, you know, we have mirrors and that, but I think what, what was really powerful is the circle work, which I was starting to explore showed me that every single person in circle was in fact representing a part of me 
that I had either owned or disowned, liked or not liked. That is one thing to see a mirror coming back through one person, but to see it reflected through 25 parts of the kaleidoscope and then having somebody translate all these dynamics to help you understand how all that shows up in life, because as in circle, as in life, it became almost like an accelerator of awareness to see how I show up, the parts that I bring, the parts I don't bring. And it became a very, very healing journey. So that was kind of my, my, my early background. And of course, having violence at a very early age and then having my nervous system be very vigilant to that, it's no surprise then that when I was in my teenage years, I went and searched for external sources of safety. So I got into the martial arts. And so then I wore a bravado, a macho type of arrogance that I was like tougher on the outside, which then drew in challenge, tribal, alpha type of dynamics. So I was outside a nightclub one night with my friend and a group, a gang came out and I stood up for myself uh, in a kind of uh, a naive, not knowing what would happen type way. And um, my friend and I got uh, attacked. I got out, but he nearly got killed. And one more kick to the head would have killed him, the doctor mm. said. And it just taught me this massive lesson. Um, but it also completely shut me down after experiencing such a violent trauma and watching somebody that I loved as a brother get completely smashed. And to the point where I, he was so disfigured, he was unrecognizable. Um, and I remember pleading with the group, the gang, uh, to stop and they didn't. And I, and I saw something in the eyes of the men that did that. And I'll never forget it. It was this cold emptiness, yeah. this complete disconnect. And I saw in that moment, like, this is the dysfunctional, disconnected masculine. But I didn't know it then. All I saw in that moment was being a man is bad. Yeah. It's not okay that if this is what masculinity is, I want no part of it. And I shut down my life force. And therefore, a big part of my journey has been about what's the healthy expression of masculinity and how can I reactivate my life force but channel it through the heart so it opens and awakens rather than diminishes and shuts down and causes a repeat of the agonizing injuries emotionally energetically to the world that has created the kind of world we live in. Wow, man, so powerful. What, so what, when you, and again, makes sense about your mission now even more, fills that out more. What is the healthy or good or best expression of healthy masculinity? Like what, what's your take on that now? Um, for me, it's about uh, leadership, heart-centered leadership. So the willingness and having the ball, so to speak, to um, feel deeply what it is that I want to go for that, but not in isolation to the larger benefit that um, my giving can have on the world. So rather than it being a selfish, I want what I want and I don't care who suffers because of it. And I take what I take because I deserve it because I'm a king. And, uh, you, you know, if you, if you don't agree with me, it's more about um, uh, feeling this huge potential to feel, find my gifts and offer them into the world. And in fact, that I don't need to be scared of my pain that my pain, in fact, carries purpose if I give myself permission to claim and own the darker sides of me, that those darker parts, the, the parts of me that um, are vampiristic, that are hungry, that are dirty, that are piggish, that are sexually objectifying everybody and everyone, and that the, all those shadows that I don't want to show because that's not very spiritual, that's not very enlightened. I notice that the more I disown those, the more they go underground. And they show up anyway, but manipulatively and subtly. And so masculinity for me that is healthy is ownership. Full, yeah. unadulterated, clean, clear, hey, this is who I am. It's vulnerability as a new form of power. It's authenticity that comes with a fearless, shameless naming and owning of this is what I bring. This is who I am. And being so free in my consciousness around that without shame that I can stand naked metaphorically or literally mm -hmm. and not be rejection sensitive to not be operating from just the younger injured wounded abandoned parts of me that 
feel like they deserve everybody to meet my needs continuously. If they don't, then I will isolate, withdraw, and go into normal power dynamics to make sure that they're punished or whatever it might be. But instead, to actually grow up and show up and not be afraid of my light to, to offer myself and uh, live the kind of life that I'm destined to live and hold nothing back. Yeah. So. Yeah, super powerful uh, aspiration, right, for us men. So if I'm a man listening, what's one tip? And I'm, let's say I'm, I'm drawn to your message here and I'm like, okay, that heart-centered leadership, all right, um, finding my purpose through my pain, um, staying in my body, staying in connection. What's uh, But I'm a little confused on where to start. What's, what's like a beginning move for a guy like this? Mm. <laughs> um, there are so many different angles, whether it's through the body, through the mind, but as quite a few guys and myself included um, can operate quite from the head space, I, I quite like to just use that rather than make it wrong because a lot of people go, oh, you're so in your head. And I'm like, hey, that's yeah. cool. Use it as this incredible tool. So there's a skill that we teach in heart IQ or heart intelligence. Um, it's called tracking which is the capacity to become self-reflective and become more aware of what's going on without getting lost in what's going on. So it's about splitting up consciousness into multiple levels. So for example, physical body, emotion, energetics, the thought and judgments that we have, as well as the intuitive impulses that we might feel. So this becomes like an internal read of the present moment and being able to practice beginning to identify what am I feeling right here, right now at each of those levels. And what do each of those parts of me want to feel more expansive and more true to who I really am? And to begin to name the disconnect. This is really key because most people want to open, so they want to focus on opening. And I would say for most guys, watch how you close because that's your key to opening. Yeah, so great. actually begin to track and say, all right, I'm getting tight in the presence of this person. I feel my, you know, my body constrict at the front. I feel my jaw tighten, I feel my frown. I'm starting to have these thoughts that I'm not enough, that I'm not okay, that uh, I should be doing this or should be bringing more of me or whatever the conversation is, or my energy suddenly gone a bit numb. I'm completely disconnected from my life force. Naming these things without dropping into the depression or the make wrong or the self-loathing and the core unworthiness is absolutely essential. And when we do that with enough practice, we begin to, to stay bright while we are feeling things that may not feel good. And I call that feeling good, feeling bad. That no matter what we may be moving with, we can actually stay in our hearts and be okay with it. Yeah. So that to me is one of the core practices of heart and you. Yep. Super. Okay. So guys, you're going to want to rewind that part, um, especially about the closing down or the contraction, like track that, right? Instead yeah. of like trying to be open, track the closure. I love it. Yeah. And take ownership of it. All right. And what's, um, let's just kind of step over to women for a minute. Uh, what's like one big thing you see women struggle with um, that's common? And then how do we work with that uh, for the listener here? Like I could say, yeah, women really struggle with their guy, right? Like they're yeah, externally, yeah. they might be externally focused on him and what he's doing wrong or something, what he's not doing. Yes. That might be one angle, but another angle might be the self-judgment uh, of herself and how she's showing up. But I'm just curious, like what you see in all the work you do with, with people. Yeah. For, um, one of the big ones is they have been in a culture that has demonized and made wrong their uncontained, raw, wild, full emotional weather and range and haven't been given permission to unleash their full expression. Mm -hmm. And what I want to support women with and what we do primarily is to un un um, unhook the wire which makes them say or has the cross wire that says, me being fully uncontained means I'm crazy and wrong and bad and nobody's going to love me and my man is going to run away if I do that. Yeah. So it's about owning the uncontained emotional raw power and letting that be not just okay, but have it be more than welcome where they can be felt in like a devotional space where it's like, wow, I love your rage. I love your awakened um, jealousy. I love your deep raw pain and your grief and your yearning heart it is so sensual and sexy and so welcome and needed and that 
it's the man's opportunity to open himself up to receive this. It's not your job to diminish yourself because they can't hold. That's their training is to open, to hold that more, not your job to close more down. So there's this cultural unwiring, which is about letting women just unwind. Um, the, the, the kind of the verbiage we use is that women tend to manage a lot in their mind. Therefore, instead of just sharing and expressing what's really up true in the moment as a present moment weather forecast, it's now a managed, conditioned, internal process that can be quite predictive, strategic, heady, and they've disconnected. It's kind of like throat up. They've, they've lost connection with the spontaneous uh, reflection of what's truly moving for them. Um, yeah. So it really is a process of embodiment when it comes to um, women, uh, men as well, but this is really a big one for women to just go uncontained so, more often. Totally. What's a, what's a, for the women listener, what's one thing she can do at home or in her yeah. relationship to move in this? In a relationship, yeah. There's an uncontained um, energy process that we, we uh, it's actually shared in my book that talks about this. The most important thing about bringing uncontained energy to a relationship where that hasn't normally been present, so this is new, mm-hmm. and that is informing and inviting your partner before you go uncontained, which is <laughs> hard because sometimes it happens and we just go there. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about triggered power. I'm talking about non-triggered power, and that's very different. Triggered power is you piss me off and I just unleash hell on you and I emotionally vomit all over you. That isn't uncontained power. Uncontained power is showing you my raw heart and letting you feel me fully, not because you've done something to me that has irritated me, but because I am feeling the present moment and my own power and my own essence to such a degree that I'm not going to hold my life force back anymore. It's just, there it is. I'm a woman. I'm proud to be wild and raw and open. So an uncontained process would simply be letting your partner know, saying, I want to practice sharing with you my uncontained truth right now. Are you open and willing to hear it? And then simply getting the buy-in, yes, I am. And then allowing that woman the space and the patience to begin to follow her body cues and her sound to reconnect to that awesome energy inside of her. So for her to find and slow, it's usually the key is slow motion movement. So it's not something wild and fast. It's something where she can breathe through her breath and begin to find where she's storing tension, give it sound and give it full embodied expression while she's being witnessed in complete presence by her man. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's the easiest process, but it's very, very healing and powerful to do. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute. I could hear a woman saying, yeah, but my guy's just going to shut down. He's, he's, I don't feel safe enough to do that with him. He's just going to lose it or he's going to go away. Um, so what's, her, what's the instruction for her? Um, well, I think one of the clear instructions, first of all, is don't confuse sound with sharing disappointments. So this isn't the time to, in the uncontainment, blame, project, make wrong, shame, and go into a complete um, meltdown in relationship to others. This is the time to feel the, the energy in self without it necessarily having a direction. That, that makes it easier for a guy to hold. Secondly, this may not be done in just the relationship with the couple. I recommend things like this in group. Therefore, yeah. finding space where you can like maybe be held and witnessed and actually have community as part of that support yeah. system. Yeah, great. And... Um what if a guy is uh, back to the guy for a minute, if he is a little scared and intimidated and, and his, his nervous system just shuts down almost, it feels like he doesn't even have a choice. She gets kind of emotional and he just clamps down and goes away and dissociates. What's a, what's a tip like a baby step for him? Actually go to the step that I shared with him initially, which is this is his chance to track in real time, his closure. So rather than going through the action of isolation, he will then instead go, okay, right now, I want to meet you, but I notice I'm completely shutting down. Something is really scary and frightening about this. I want to curl up into a ball. And there's a part of me that wants to right now just run away from this. And I'm sorry, I wish I could be holding it, but I can't. Now that takes a level of, um, I would say, emotional intelligence to be able to articulate that Mm -hmm. closure. But that's what the tracking practice allows you to do is in real time 
communicate your disconnect so that you don't act on the disconnect, you reveal it. Yeah. And this is the question that we often ask to couples and to individuals. It's not, are you in pain? But what are you doing with your pain? That's mm-hmm. the important question. Yeah, I love that. And I also love this frame of tracking being something we can do out loud, right? Because that's a way we can oh, stay connected, absolutely. right? Versus yeah. I'm tracking myself maybe in isolation and you're sitting right yeah. there and I'm over here just like, holy shit, holy shit. Well, that's the process. You know, you asked about what could a man do? What can a woman do? But the couple practice that I would recommend is the verbalized tracking together as a check-in each morning. So where each couple get to just connect, tune in, that could be a form of just closing their eyes and holding their hands and just being together for 30 seconds. It's as simple as that, breathing together. But then actually checking in by consciously asking for the attention of the other. This is really important. So it could be something like, I'd like to share, or I'd like to check in. May I have your attention, please? To actually verbalize that request. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things that men and women find difficult to do is to actually own and express needs. It's often needs are camouflaged, brought underground, hinted at, hoping that somebody would guess them, meeting them without saying it through mind reading. But there's a practice in just saying, I really need your presence. I really would love to receive your quality attention right now. So the check-in practice is a way of doing that by simply saying, I'd like to check in or I'd like to share. May I have your attention? please?" And then there's just a moment of silence as that person consciously practices receiving that energy. And then using that amplified presence, they then practice their tracking out loud, exactly like you just said. Like They now verbalize their disconnect. They verbalize what's going on physically, emotionally, energetically, what's going on in their head, in their mind, their process. What are they managing? What's open? What's closed? What judgments are popping up in the space? And that awareness practice on a daily basis bonds people together because it's like their inner world becomes known mm-hmm. and creates a really, really closeness with, with, the, with the couple. Yeah. And so many of us want to feel known, right? We want to feel seen and understood in our experience. And, but we can't really, if we're not letting people in on that. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. This is, this is great uh, because, you know, a lot of people have this fantasy about what intimacy equals. It means explosive sex. We're connected all the time, uh, blah, 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 you know, whatever. But I think what I'm hearing you say, and what I'm loving about this is no intimacy is revealing ourselves in each moment. Right. Indeed especially in the moments when we're closed. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, um, our hearts aren't binary in the sense that it's either open or closed and with yes or no, on or off. It's always like this door that opens a little bit, closes, and you know we so want to feel safe to be fully open. And yet, it's not realistic to think that relationships are going to create a space of safety where our hearts will be open continuously. What I found is that they open very wide at the beginning of a relationship, then they parental entrainments come in and suddenly we start to recreate family dynamics and we experience the same closure that we did when we were young that is unresolved and undigested. And then it's a process of actually working through that. And the best way of working through that is through awareness and consciousness and dialogue, being able to share through it. But not just through dialogue, because dialogue can be verbal, but can also be sexual. So in other words, um, role playing and moving through family dynamics sexually Um, power dynamics sexually, role play sexually, bringing through uncontained wildness, anger, rage, jealousy sexually. So the actual polarity channel um, is a very incredible way to heal without just necessarily talking about it. Although I love giving people the opportunity to practice having better communication skills, I'm I'm more, I, I, I feel the shortcut is to go direct to the embodiment rather than the verbal channel person. Okay, cool. On that note, um, because you have, you know, you have a lot of superpowers in the, it seems to me in the realm of like helping people heal and work through some of that early um, parental baggage and childhood trauma and stuff. What's, um, can you walk us through like a, maybe a simple exercise that you might do with someone um, around a trauma? Like how do we, mm-hmm. what's your take on trauma as it shows up in an adult relationship and, and how do we deal with that? Because most of the models people do is they, they go to a therapist, um, hopefully a really good one. Uh, maybe they have some results, but often they don't. Um, what, what, uh, what can people do here? Yeah. Um, to give a like first stage kind of example of this, cause it can go to different places. Um, 
to bring in the therapeutic modalities in circle is a really wonderful thing. So um, I like to combine the therapy uh, tool, say, of a gestalt, where people get to communicate unresolved pain with another person, whether it be uh, if, it, if they're there, great, or if they're not there, it's fine, like mum, dads, whether they're alive or not. But to actually not do it with an empty chair, but to actually enroll people, like in family constellations, where mm -hmm. people in the group, because you've got a large group, we, we work with 30, 40 people in a group, and to actually selectively bring in the people that they have blocks or residue or undigested pain with, enroll them, and begin to work that through verbally and physically. The part of the work that we do that is, I would say, quite controversial, but highly effective and requires a lot of skill to facilitate because it's highly risky, is what we call the physicalized gestalt. This is not part of gestalt uh, trauma therapy. It's something that I experimented with under really tight conditions, saw that it worked beautifully. And then when I did it with couples, it was one of the quickest, most liberating things to do. And yet when you tell couples that this is what they're going to do, they want to run out of the room. Mm -hmm. And a physicalized gestalt is literally where you take one of the cup, you know, it's usually the guy, um, but it could be the woman as well. And we wrap them up with pillows and tape, literally pat them up like the Michelin man, make him completely protected and give the woman the opportunity to express her uncontained rage um, through usually a baton, for example, and make impact. And of course, nobody wants to do that at some point because it's like, oh, I love him and he's so yeah, wonderful, no, I don't want to hurt him. <laughs> and yet there's something about the, you know, it's one thing to verbally share, there's nothing to actually bring the whole body and to let them go completely unleashed and all in with their fire and to entrain the father figure. So because usually they're projecting the dad on them anyway. So yeah. we just say, just go for it. If you're going to project, go all the way and then we'll de-roll at the end once that energy has been given full motion. Yeah. Um, one of the principles of um, the, the work that we do is we need to feel it to heal it. So most people don't really feel the deepest parts of their nervous system, so they just store it as tension and project it because they don't want to feel it. Mm -hmm. And now that partner will always hold that other part. And then it triggers another law of couple dynamics, which says whatever you repress, somebody else will have to express for you. So whatever I don't want to feel, you're going to feel double because you're going to feel your own anger. But if I'm not good with my anger, you're going to feel mine as well, which means you're going to go crazy and I'm going to blame you for being crazy, but you're holding my anger. So yeah. rather out than in type thing. So we might pad somebody up, make it safe, and then I will coach them to get into their body. Sometimes I'll need to do what's called an emotional kickstart, which is when somebody isn't really comfortable with their anger. Because anger is a primal emotion that we work with a lot. A lot of people don't like it. They don't yeah. like anger. They think it's wrong, bad, shameful, or hurtful, painful. It's going to be violent. They're going to confuse it with aggression. So sometimes it requires a kickstart. Their life force is a bit disconnected. So I'll come around them and I lend them my life force. I literally have found a way to transmit my fire through the, through the back and help them feel it. And it kind of like activates their voice, their sound, and it kickstarts them. And then I let them go and they're off and they do their thing. Hmm. Um, so it's like a fire lighter, a little bit of tinder, and just yep. strike the match and get them off. Um, so that's an example of some of the work that we do. And the power of doing this in a group is they get witnessed in the very ranges that they've judged as wrong. And then they get to take in the group and feel love in areas that they would never have imagined feeling loved in. And that's yeah. the key. It's in the witnessing right. that digests the trauma. I would well, say even more than the actual action itself. Uh, right. So much of that is, is in the witnessing. I, I love that because, again, we grew up in a family, right? We grew up, there were people watching and just sitting there and doing nothing or in the room and silence. And so to have people accept us after we go through yeah. and reveal these really scary parts of ourselves has got to be, you know, I mean, I know from my own gestalt work that I did years ago, uh, it was unbelievably healing for me, right? Yeah. To be witnessed in my gnarliness <laughs> yes indeed and you know that you, you asked about specifically when somebody brings in you know unresolved trauma which is often the case when we start relationships that those things will surface and so we might meet the moment first with an activity or an exercise or a process like that but that is like a, a not a surface level because it goes very deep but it is the start of a much bigger journey 
which kind of trans, it, uh, eventually it moves away from where am I hurting to where is the resource to go to ecstasy. You see, in chiropractic, we, I saw very clearly that there's two types of patients that will come into my clinic. There's the one that says, I'm hurting, I'm broken, I'm in pain, I just picked up a brick wrong, help me doc, help me fix it so I can go back to work and do what I do, and then I'll come back when it goes out again. Yeah. We call that pain-based clients. And then you've got those other people who've made a leap of transformational awareness in their consciousness that realize this isn't about removing pain. This is about peak performance. This is about how deep can I go? How open can I be? How much of my potential that is raw can be now opened and expressed out into the world? And therefore, it's not what do I need to do to remain functional, but how, what do I need to do to become exceptional? And so couples that come in through, fix me, we're broken, we've been to therapy, it hasn't worked, could you just help us get along? That's classic gestalt work is the first stage and they'll be functional again. But I'm not interested in functionality. I need to then educate them while they're there and say, guys, this is only going to satisfy for a moment. But what you really want is, how do you make this into an exceptional intimacy? A mind-blowing intimacy. An intimacy that you will thrive off, not just survive off. Um, that your kids could be inspired by and go, holy moly now, that is what I want in my world. That they're not shamed and embarrassed to do anything differently. And then that's when it gets exciting. That's, that's the other channel. And there's a whole different set of exercises and polarity generators and different types of what I would call collective spaces. In the, uh, collective spaces where uh, if, if I have a problem individually, I might go and seek a coach or a therapist and I say, you know, I've got this issue, I've got this block, can you help me out? And, you know, we figure out who did what to me, how and when, and I might get some resolution, I might feel better and open by it, and it's all good. But it's an individual impact delivered by an individual. And it might have an impact to more than one because I'm taking it home into my family. Yeah. But what I love is the collective space, which is where the group, the many, entrain their nervous systems so that you and I begin to move as one. Our rhythms, our sine waves, our, our nervous system literally begins to sync up. And the strength and the potency of what we can now do together is now exponentially increased. So examples of collective space, things like tribal energy. Like you bring a man into a space where he's no longer just doing a gestalt to move through his daddy issues, but he's now being initiated by strong, present, conscious men into a full tribal activated kind of movement, ritual or dance. So that type of tribal space could do more for a man's nervous system than a simple gestalt with an empty chair. Sure. Similarly, a woman being awakened into temple priestess goddess energy is going to take her far further than dealing with her mum alone. Mm -hmm. But dealing with a mum comes first. But if she stops there and she misses the initiation into priestess, how, how can she really thrive? Yeah. So you're using, so, you're using relationships and the, and the circle work, the group work you do to, in your words, initiate someone basically into their personal you know, power and what they're here to do and who they really are, right? Indeed. And then it takes off into a far more spiritual realm that... Yeah. Um, you know, it can be a bit out there for people. Um, it's not the conventional stuff at all. Um, but I would say what makes Hard IQ quite special is that it meets the person where they're at. So it, it takes them on the full journey. It's not like, okay, we're just going to see relationships as spiritual. I see it as therapeutic, as wellness-based, as yogic, and as a spiritual practice, all of it combined. And that there is a stage for everybody, and we move people through wherever they happen to be individually and also as a couple. Yeah. You know, the issues become a little bit more striking when one person in the couple is ready to go to another stage and the other one is a little bit left behind because they've got their own kind of like stuff still in the way. Mm -hmm. So you can get gaps that come in, um, but they can be bridged. But doing nothing doesn't bridge the gap. Isolating and forgetting yeah. and ignoring it doesn't bridge the gap. Yeah. It just makes it subtly worse over time. So I recommend just, you know, dealing with it. <laughs> I'm with you. Cool. <laughs> now, now, obviously, that's a pretty deep range you have with someone in a, in a group. And if they come to one of your retreats, which we can talk about in a minute, um, if they don't, if they aren't going to come see you in person live um, and come to one of your events and go through this whole alchemical transformational process, which sounds extremely amazing, what's, uh, what's something they can do at home? Or what's like, a, again, a first step 
um, including your book, like what's a, so, mm-hmm. a way for them to start to get resourced and move, move toward that. Yeah. Sounds good. So I would say, you know, so this is the book that I wrote. It's called insights, intimacy, why relationships fail and how to make them work. Um, rather than just describe about what heart intelligence is, it's actually a manual that people can follow along and do exercises as a couple at home. So it's actually more of a workbook than it is just an inspiration or, oh, that's nice to know. Mm-hmm. So I would recommend that. And actually if your partner's open to it, them reading it too and actually doing some of the exercises, just doing some of the basic stuff. That would be a really great way. Now with the book, there is actually an online home study companion course that has actual video demos of me working with clients demonstrating every single process. So that's free. That comes with the book. You just need to sign up on the website and you get instant access to that. So it's really a book and a course combined. Cool. Um, wow, amazing. I think that's a really good step. I, um, if people want to go deeper online, uh, we have this program called Hard IQ Foundations, which, as the name suggests, is a really lovely first-level training on tracking. And it really goes deep to that skill I was telling you about earlier, about the verbalization of what's going on for us. And it looks at what we're feeling, what we want, how to communicate needs, how to identify our defense mechanisms and shadows, and how to communicate them in a way that really lands. Yeah, um, great. I think that's a really great uh, you know, online home study programs that can be done in under six weeks. Okay, cool. And I'll include all those links in the show notes, everybody who's listening. Perfect. Now, uh, Christian, what's, um, what's the sort of final tip you want to leave people with before we share your website? What's one uh, just parting advice you have for the listener? Yeah, it's to sound uh, a bit, maybe a bit trite, but I'm going to put it in a way that maybe stresses its importance and nuance. Um, intimacy is really the experience of me loving myself while I happen to be present and looking and being with you. Now, a lot of times people will see or think that if I love you, then there is something that comes from me to you. So that often people will say, I'm sending you love as if it's something that comes out of my hands and Uh there's literally stuff coming out and you're receiving it and going, okay, he's loving me right now. I can feel his love. He's sending me love. And yet really, if you were to break it down as an energetic, the experience of love occurs when I am so open and so free in consciousness and life force in me that you feel the love that moves in me and you experience that as feeling felt. It's like a crystal glass and another crystal glass and there's this one goes ding, this one vibrates with love and you think there's a transmission, it's not. It's an, it's an entrainment, it's a frequency resonance. So the more I try to love another while disconnecting from self, the less love I will be really mm-hmm. expressing. Mm. So self-intimacy, the experience of being with you, opening yourself, feeling yourself, connecting to yourself, to your breath, to your body, to your movement, to your awareness, to your awakening, is the essential practice. But here's the key. I can be self-intimate, close my eyes, and be off in my own world, and you could be standing in front of me, and you're going, why am I even here? They're doing their own thing and I'm not even part of it. So self-intimacy in a relationship is, can I stay deeply connected to the bliss and ecstasy and life force of me while remaining present to you? It's that combination of embodied presence with self while I am fixed and in connection with another. But I don't lose myself with you and I don't become self-absorbed with myself and lose you. It's, the, the, it's that dance, that beautiful in syncness that we're working towards. Yeah, wonderful. And I, I want to echo what you said earlier, which is the degree to which we connect with other is the degree to which we connect with ourselves. So I really think that's what you're talking about here is, again, for the listener, like find your way to connect to you and bring that and in, learn to entrain. I love that word too. Um, entrain with your partner in that way super powerful. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Christian, it's been a, it's been a real treat, man. I, I just admire what you're doing. I, I'm appreciative. I'm like grateful. I'm like, hell yes. Let's help the parents, help the kids. Let's grow this culture up. You know, let's do this. 
uh, where can folks find you and find out more about you? Yes. So um, at heartiq.com um, is our main calendar and it shows a lot more about what we do in terms of events and stuff like that. Um, there's also a blog that I'm posting regularly, videos and content and stuff. And the core event that we invite people to come to is done here in Holland at the Hard IQ Retreat Center. It's what's called Insights to Intimacy. It's basically in the embodiment of the book that I was telling you that, hope, that happens over four days. And that's where people will literally put it into practice and actually leave with the skills to create the container for this type of ongoing relationship. So it's an upgrade to their relationship to become more heart intelligent and they get the skills and the tools to actually build that container going home so they can continue to practice it. Um, right. So yeah, and information about that can be found in the book as well, of course. The actual uh, website where they can get access to this book and to the companion course and information about the event is insightsintimacy.com. So hardiq.com is the generic website for all information about stuff, but the specific work relating to the book, the event is insights to intimacy.com. Okay, excellent. And um, one little nugget, maybe from that book, if you were to teach, you know, I'm, I'm beginning to ask my listeners this or my guests this, uh, if you were to teach, you know, if there was, is the relationship school expands and you were to come in and teach one thing, one little teeny thing, what do you think that most important thing that you would most love to teach is? Yeah. Connecting to juice. I want to, I want to show people how to connect completely joyfully, shamelessly and brightly to their life force and mm. hold nothing back. Yeah. Outstanding. Okay. Cool, man. Thank you so much. Big virtual hug from over here in the States. <laughs> <laughs> you too. It was beautiful. Thank you for your yeah, devotion and care and your longing and passion to, to, to do this. This is so cool. Yeah, you got it. Well, I hope to meet you in person one day and we'll hang out. Yeah, me too. All right. Really good one, yeah? Lots of amazing gems in there for you to mine. But I'm going to try to make it easy for you and give you an action step right now. Okay, so for the women, remember he said you've had this you know, lineage, uh, probably thousands of years of being made wrong for your emotional state. Um, I'm sure much longer. And in your own life, you've had uh, people tell you that you're too emotional, you're too much, um, you're too reactive, etc. So the baby step here is to obviously stop subordinating to those messages in a safe container here of a partnership or a women's group or something and um, begin to inch toward that if you haven't already done that in your life. So if you've got a partner, you can, as he said, you basically get consent first and say, honey, um, can I, you know, I've been contained in my emotional bandwidth my whole life and even in our marriage. And I'd like to start, you know, experimenting with letting out my anger more or my tears more. Uh, is that okay here? And can I practice doing that here? Some of you might be with a partner who that's just going to blow them out. Um, then you go to a therapist or a friend or a women's group or somewhere else to practice and get comfortable. And ideally, you want to have a partner where they embrace your fullness, including your rage, your grief, and despair, and your joy and bliss, and all of that. And we, as Christian, made a real clear distinction there. This is not coming from a triggered place where I'm going to blame and, and uh, project and all that. The practice would be to do it when you're not uh, 10 on the trigger scale, and you're actually pretty resourced and in your body, and you're like, okay, I'm going to just try to start to express sound or express my emotions here. And then you slowly, on medium, you know, what I would recommend is on a medium trigger level, like a five, uh, try to express I'm angry. I'm so angry right now. And, and um, you know, look at your partner, um, but don't point the finger, don't hit, et cetera, right? Just I'm angry. That can be very empowering because a lot of us grew up in families where that even that expression wasn't okay. Now that might be an exercise for some of the men as well, depending on what your growing edge is and where your work is. Okay. So the baby step though is to get consent and then begin to practice, right? That's your action step for the women, or let's say the partner who is feeling emotionally uh, jammed up and like there's no room to express yourself. 
Okay, you got to start expressing yourself. I think it's really important in a relationship, including our emotions. All right, next, for the guys, your job is to not collapse in the face of that and also not collapse in the face of your emotions. But the baby step here for you, uh, depending on where you're at, I'm just going to give you this one. It may not fit for you, but it might, is to track your inner life and speak about it openly. Now, this one would be good for both partners is, uh, like you said, you know, a lot of spiritual people, including, you know, I'll just say a lot of spiritual people will say, um, you know, you got to open your heart all the time and just keep opening. But uh, to open on top of closure is to override something that's going on that's true for us. So the step is to just say, I feel closed and I'm having a really hard time. I'm uh, opening right now. And I'm noticing my closure in my chest, and I, it's hard to look at you, and I keep looking away. Those kind of steps and speaking, taking responsibility essentially for your closure, I think is a brilliant move. Okay, so those are your two action steps you guys can play with. Um, and again, this one would probably be one to go back and listen to uh, parts that resonated for you because there was a lot in here, right? And community. I want to underscore one thing he said about. Healing in community, being seen in community, and getting feedback and mirrors and reflection from growth-oriented and development-oriented people who are going to give you reflections that aren't daggers, that aren't uh, coming across as judgments and like, hey, I'm going to try to cut you down here, but real feedback, real-time feedback. And again, that's something Christian uh, does clearly in his trainings, and you can find out more at the Heart IQ Network. Go to heartiq.com to find out more about Christian Pankhurst. And we'll include all of his links in the show notes for you. You can just click the link on your phone and boom, you're there. Okay? And we work the community angle as well here at the Relationship School. It's powerful. So real-time feedback from real people is highly, highly valuable. You know, a lot of you are hanging out with people, honestly, that are holding you back in your life and are probably not that honest and aren't willing to tell you the full truth. And, and you might be one of those people also. So, you know, own that and begin to move towards putting yourself in positions that are more uncomfortable where you can grow and be um, take risks and start practicing this whole relationship game. Because again, it's practice that's going to make you a stronger, more resilient partner someday. Okay? JasonGaddis.com slash Relationship School. If you want to start training now, you can join the Relationship School Roots community. And you can apply at jasongaddis.com slash roots, just like it sounds. And we meet a couple times a week, excuse me, a couple times a month to practice. It's all about practice. All right? Awesome. Okay, guys, have a wonderful rest of your day, morning, evening, and we'll talk very soon. 